What's up guys, it's your boy Matt Ogus, and today's video is all about the squat. We'll be going over the 16 biggest and most common squat mistakes that I see people make all over the place. <laughs> This video starts with a lot of the common beginner mistakes that people make, but then we start getting into more of the mistakes that everybody makes, including people who've been training for years, advanced squatters too. If you enjoy this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, make sure that you subscribe, and hit that little bell button so you get to see all of my videos as I make them. All right guys, I hope you enjoy this video. Let's get into the squat mistakes. Mistake number one is squatting in these. What are those? <laughs> Guys, these are shoes that you do not want to squat in, all right? Basketball shoes or shoes that are really comfortable for like walking or long distance. Um, really the puffy heel type shoes that give. Uh, you guys don't want shoes that give. You, you don't want to be, you know, squatting on a mattress, right? So these are a little bit better, but you can even beat these. Uh, typically I'll recommend using if, uh, if you can't maybe get like a squat shoe or Olympic squatting shoe, something like a pair of Chuck Taylors, uh, Converse Chuck Taylors, usually they're really flat. There's not too much give, and it's way better than squatting in basketball shoes or shoes that just basically are like mattresses, cushions. Don't squat on cushions. Don't do that, guys. You want direct transfer to the ground without a little buffer zone. That buffer zone is all bad, so that's Mistake number one, squatting in these. The next mistake I see a lot of people make is when they barbell back squat when they really can't. Uh, so essentially I see a lot of people jump up the level of squat progression uh, beyond what they're capable of. So people try to do barbell back squats when they really can't even body weight squat. Uh, there's typically a progression of uh, going from really having limited zero mobility zero strength to work your way towards being able to back squat and I can cover this in a whole entire video but uh, if you're lacking the strength for example the leg strength to be able to squat then you probably want to build up strength with the leg press and if you're lacking the mobility so you can't really get down um, your, your ankle mobility so on and so forth you might want to progress starting off with body weight high box squats down to uh, parallel box squats with body weight eventually working your way towards doing counterweighted squats and then from counterweighted squats to something like goblet squats and then from goblet squats perhaps to front squats front squats to back squats so uh, a lot of people make the mistake of jumping directly from never squatting ever and then jumping right in doing back squats and uh, their forms all over the place destroying their knees and they didn't really progress uh, from you know, the body weight, high, the body weight, high box squat. So that's mistake number two. The next mistake is kind of a two for one. I see two mistakes happen here. Uh, the first that I notice a lot of is uh, those who are relatively new to squatting aren't lining up directly centered with the bar. And what I'll see is asymmetrical bar placement on the back. Then when you take that off, it's all off to one side and it really can mess up your back. Part of this two for one is I'll see what uh, you might call a, a calf raise to get the bar out of place. And typically, this will happen because of uh, you know squat racks might have certain pin levels, and you either got to pick this pin or you got to pick this pin. And if you pick the high pin, you're probably thinking, yeah, I'll just put on the high one because I don't want to have to like really, you know squat deep to get it out. But then what happens is this back up. What you end up having to do is you'll find that a lot of people end up having to like calf raise just to get it out. Uh, you might call that the ballerina walkout. We don't want to see that either. That is, it's like a recipe for disaster. That's all bad. So make sure it's centered on your back. Make sure it's low enough. It's better for you to have to unrack it at a lower level than unracking it at a high level and having to do a calf raise just to get it out. 
Actually guys, let's do a three for one. Uh, one more typical mistake when it comes to the lift off is using a staggered stance like this. Now this may not be a big deal when you're using warm up weight or working your way up, but uh, especially when you're using your working weight, using a staggered stance and getting it off in a place adds extra steps that you don't want to take. You want to minimize the amount of steps that you take. And another big thing is that uh, it kind of reinforces just overall bad habits, right? You want, I mean, typically when you get to your heavy work, you'll be going like this, and you want to practice how you do your heavy work. So even with your light work, even if I'm just going off the bar, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm gonna treat my light work, treat my warm ups, like I treat my, my heavy work. So, all right guys. So guys, this next mistake uh, is over arching or over extension of the back. And typically we're talking about super duck position. Now, I know a lot of uh, guys and girls, they're told in straight classes, you know, arch your back. And that's mainly because it's probably safer to be over arched than like this. So you definitely don't want to squat like this, but you also don't want to squat like that. What it typically looks like is this. What you end up getting is it's something like a good morning, of course. Like this. It's all bad. Okay, guys. What I've found, too, is that it also causes a lot of lower back pain, injury, by really overarching. Um, now, arching can, a lot of, can help a lot of people who have, you know, shoulders forward syndrome and uh, back flexion problems uh, from being, you know, at their desk all day. Kind of you know, getting them started with bodyweight squats where you're focusing more on arching the back like this can help them get into a more neutral type position. But you want to keep that, that core braced and your back pretty much neutral um, with a, a little bit leaning towards the... Uh, extension side, uh, if anything, you don't really be, want to be braced and leaning forward like that. So, yeah, it's not necessarily about going like this, it's really just about keeping all of this tight and keeping it as you're descending in the squat. You just want to keep that back nice and straight. Also, it's really hard to keep your core nice and tight when you're overly focusing on um, you know, extending your back like this. So you got a lot of tension back here, but not enough tension throughout the entirety of your core. So it's really just keeping it neutral, bracing the core. All right guys, so the next biggest mistake is valgus knee, or disengaged hips, caving knees. What that looks like is this, all right? What we end up getting is something like this, okay? Well, we definitely don't want to see any sort of, you know, knee caving in, especially on the downward. Now, what I'll notice is, you know, a lot of people do a really good job with, you know, uh, their warm-up weights, and then they end up working their way up to their working sets, and whether it's right off the bat or eventually, you know, we see form breakdown occur. You know, the first couple reps might look good, and then eventually the third rep, and then the fourth rep, and then the fifth rep, and then every rep beyond that, we see valgus D, which means the knees are coming in, and we typically just, we just don't want to see that, period. So what I recommend for that is just sticking to weight rep ranges and ending a set as soon as you know you have trouble keeping your hips engaged and your knees tracking over your toes. You want to make sure that those knees track over your toes at all times and when this happens that's definitely bad. We don't want any of that. So if this happens that's probably where you should end a set like I said and stick to weight reps sets that you can complete with good knees tracking over your toes. Alright, so the next biggest problem that I see a lot of people have is uh, pronation of the foot or supination of the foot. So they're basically their ankle is kind of, their foot's rolling inward while they're squatting or rolling outward. Uh, this is also called like limp foot or um, I think there's some other names for it too. But try to imagine that your, your foot is like this box. You're trying to get all four, all four corners of that box on the floor. Or better yet, let's just imagine three points of contact in terms of your foot, right? So you have, so let's just imagine we got one ball here, we got one ball here, and then we got the heel, right? 
but try to imagine all points, all those balls on the floor. Or like I said, imagine that your foot's a box and you're trying to get all four corners of that box, all four, four corners on the ground while you're squatting. That's gonna help you do, it's gonna help keep your foot from you know, pronating inward, supinating outward, and it's also gonna help keep your heel on the ground, which is also a big problem for a lot of people. Too much of the weight is forward, and their heels come off the ground, which cause a lot of uh, structural instability, knee problems, so on and so forth. Keep all four corners of the box on the ground, guys, four corners. All right, so the next mistake that a, lot, that a lot of people make is you'll see them basically perform like a quarter squat, half squat, standing leg press like this, right? We do not want to see that. It's a lot of forward knee movement without keeping the hips engaged, without keeping the core braced, tight, and engaged. And uh, typically, you, you see a lot of people performing like that when they really should be performing more of a hips back type of squat because they, a lot of these guys lack the kind of uh, ankle mobility to allow them to squat deeper. Those people who lack you know, the ankle mobility uh, or have knee problems definitely shouldn't be squatting with a really knees forward type squat. They probably need to bring those hips back and engage more of their hips um, since they're lacking in other, in other places. So uh, it's not a great idea to be doing quarter squats, half squats especially when you're just bringing the knees forward without really engaging too much of your posterior. Uh, and now here goes the next tip, uh, which is kind of the flip side of this. So kind of the reverse of this is another mistake. A lot of people completely avoid, they think that the knees should never pass the toes. And there are so many like uh, fitness instructors, people with certifications, uh, strength coaches, who will be like, no, we gotta keep those shins vertical, right? Keep that butt back, shins vertical, so on and so forth. That is, it's not a black and white rule that applies to everyone. For example, for myself, if I never let my knees come forward like they like, like check this out. You see this? This feels so good for me, so comfortable, so natural, because everyone has a different uh, body structure, limb length, uh, so on and so forth. So certain people are gonna have a much easier time just squatting straight down like I can. Other people can't do that. Maybe they don't have the ankle mobility or the knees uh, just won't allow them to. They need to bring more of the hips back. So, uh, but on the flip side, what this can cause is a lot of people who really should just be sitting more straight down are now sitting really far back and turning good, turning squats into good mornings like that. So there's really a balance. Uh, you you kind of need to just squat however best suits your body and not just blanket statement yourself thinking, okay, my knees should never pass my toes or you know my hips should be super far back. Uh, for most people, you might find you know, a happy medium or maybe you might lean more towards one or the other, but don't automatically rule one of the two out, right? You're not automatically someone who should let their knees pass their toes. You're not automatically someone who, who should uh, sit really far back on your squats. It's gonna depend on you. This next mistake is actually something I'm sure a lot of you guys want me to talk about, and that's butt weight, right? Like, how do I fix my butt weight? Uh, so on and so forth. <laughs> There's like so many factors when it comes to butt weight. Uh, if you're not sure what butt weight is, I'll demonstrate, I'll demonstrate real quick. And it might look something like this. So you see how my butt tucks underneath itself? First, you kind of got to understand why that happens. Okay, guys? So I'm going to show you something real quick. At all times, the bar has to stay above the center of gravity, midfoot. Okay? So what this means is if you go past a certain depth, let's say I was trying to keep my shins vertical, hips back. Watch what happens when I'm keeping about this, about a shoulder stance. Squat, squat. Okay, so I'm trying to keep my hips back, hips back, hips back, hips back, hips back. At some point, you know, if I'm not like opening my hips enough, if my if my form isn't changed, what happens is when you go deep enough, you'll see the butt weight happen. What's one way to combat that? For example, look what happens when I bring my knees forward. All right, guys. So look at look at this. The butt weight disappears when my knees come forward. So there's there's certain things that have to happen. If you go deep enough, and your knees aren't going forward. You're Basically, so the bar can stay in place, uh, but midfoot center gravity at all times, you're gonna have a butt weight. 
So there's a few different things you want to have to uh, think about is how low are you going, uh, your foot stance, opening your hips, keeping it back. Maybe you're going too deep with, with a really wide kind of sumo stance. What if you're avoiding allowing your knees uh, coming forward to the detriment of increasing your butt weight? So that's one of the things, guys, that happens a lot with people that try to hit deep squats without letting your knees, with, you know, avoiding allowing forward traction of the knees. Different extents, you know, our knees are going to come forward to different, different uh, levels. And the more vertical your torso is, the more your knees are going to come forward. Just keep in mind, if you have a uh, forward posture um, and your knees aren't coming forward enough uh, and you go deep enough, you're going to get a butt wink. And typically it's not a huge deal if it's just really slight, but it's when you become complacent with uh, butt wink at really high loads, heavy weights, that you uh, might start running into problems down the road. But one thing I recommend is if you find yourself having this butt wink from early on, uh, combat it, right? Film yourself from the side, uh, try to perform squats where you're not really having tons and tons of butt wink. Adjust yourself, find the right stance for you so that, you know, and here's the thing too, you don't necessarily have to go ass to the grass. And I would recommend not going ass to the grass, especially if that causes you to do this, right? So combine these factors together, maybe allow yourself, you know, maybe allow those knees to come forward a little bit more, you know, work on your ankle mobility, like doing stuff like this. If you at home, get into like a dragon stretch, but then go forward, put your weight on, on top of your, uh, your thigh right here and you know every once in a while just stretch out your ankles like this get some uh, please tendon uh, mobility right here increase your ankle mobility so that you'll feel more comfortable allowing those knees to come forward more so if you do want to hit that depth that apparently you've been chasing uh, you'll be able to without having that butt wing so guys remember there's biomechanics are what determine whether a butt wing occurs or not right so there's things that you play with so that it doesn't happen, so that you minimize it. Uh, definitely don't become complacent with tons of butt weight with heavy weights. Next major mistake that I see people make is they walk right into the gym, throw the 45 plates on, and just start warming up with 135 pounds. And that's definitely better than jumping straight to your working sets. And I sometimes see people, you know, warm up with the bar. But I think we could do even better than that, guys. Uh, typically, I usually like to include at least a bare bones warm up of some sort. It doesn't have to be super complex, but maybe pick at least three to five of your favorite like dynamic warm ups and do that. Here's some of my favorites. Uh, I like to practice some hip hinging. So whether it's you know 10 to 15 reps of that, I like to do a squat to hip hinge like this. Maybe you know 10 to 15 reps of that. I like to do you know some body weight squats, whether it's 8, 10, 12 reps of that, and I usually like to do two sets. Uh, you know, I'll do some leg kicks like this, 8 to 12 reps, and I'll do some front leg kicks like this. When you do a front leg kick, keep the opposite glute contracted. So I'm flexing my right glute while kicking my left leg, uh, and opposite for my right leg, left glute. You know, anywhere between 8, 10 kicks per side, each type. Combined with these other little things that I do, uh, my, it's definitely better than jumping straight into you know 135. All right, guys. So try out those warm ups. Don't jump straight to your working weight, and if you can, don't even jump straight to 135. Do a little bit of warming up. Next tip has to do with the position of our elbows, right? So quite often, a lot of us when we're learning how to squat for the first time, we get told the cue, you know. Keep your elbows really far back, and typically that helps people get into the uh, upper back shelving that they need, if, especially if they're doing a low bar squat, right? So what I mean by that is, quite often when we tell beginners, you know, keep those elbows back, create that shelf. Uh, it helps us create a nice place for the bar, right? But the thing is, you can still create that shelf um, regardless of where your elbows are. And one of the issues that people have, sometimes, not, not everyone, is that say your high bar, or low bar squat, I say I'm high bar squatting, and I keep my elbows really far back, right? I'm doing these squats, what happens when I really force these elbows back, 
is that it kind of arches me forward, or it has the possibility to make me lose my lose my upper back tension and kind of fall forward. And with heavier loads, that's really dangerous. So, and you'll probably notice this, guys, but typically your body's natural reaction when you're under enough weight is what happens is your elbows naturally just go directly underneath your underneath the bar, right? So a more natural position for the elbows when you're squatting is actually underneath the bar. That still means that you still want to break the bar on your back. Like I'm still really, really keeping my elbow back tight and I'm pulling the bar into me. I'm still pulling it into me, but that doesn't mean I have to keep my elbows back. I'm still creating that tight upper back shelf, whether I'm high bar or low bar squatting, while my elbows are staying more at a place where I can keep a neutral spine more than like this, which might cause you sometimes with heavy enough load or enough fatigue to arch forward. So keep in mind guys, naturally, usually whether you want it or not, your elbows tend to just fall underneath your underneath your, uh, your hands, underneath the weight. So if you actually just kind of allow it more so to begin with, you might be able to avoid some of the problems that could occur if you overly really bring those elbows back. So it's okay, it's actually great if your elbows are underneath your hands, underneath the weight. So that way you're not arching forward, guys. Remember though, you still wanna keep that upper back tightness, that shelf, for wherever you're putting the bar, whether it's on top of your traps or on top of your rear delts um, with a low bar squat. The next big mistake is improper angle braking. And uh, this will depend on your body mechanics, how you squat, and what potential mistake you might be making. But for example, with a lot of high bar squatters, so let's say people whose body mechanics might be like mine, you're able to stay really upright when you squat naturally. You might be able to get into a good, you know, Asian squat really well, good ankle mobility. Um, but a lot of times these folks end up buying into the idea that you have to break at the hips before you break at the knees. And what ends up happening is something really bad, right? This kind of ties into, um, this kind of ties into the other tip idea, right? And that's, let's just say, naturally, for my body mechanics, it feels great to do this. And believe me, guys, a lot of people who are able to do this. Uh, but a lot of people will avoid doing what's naturally great for them because they hear they should break the hips first. So what happens is high bar squatters will do this. And then what happens there, they usually end up in a butt wing or it's just not the best place to be, right? They're, they're squatting good mornings. They're, they're squatting like a low bar squatter, but they're a high bar squatter. So you end up getting, you know, you end up getting just funky stuff happening. And likewise, now typically, low bar squatters are usually lucky because for most low bar squatters, you kind of do want to break up the hips just a little bit before, not like this, but you usually want to break the hips before you're breaking at the knees. Um, and that's usually a good tip. But at the same time, a lot of people overdo it, right? They might completely break at the hips, literally pause, and then just slowly go down. It has to be, it should be a fluid motion, right? So here I am, the work squatting, I break the hips, and then I go down. It's not like this. It's just a kind of fluid motion. It goes one directly into the other. Um, and there was something else I wanted to say real quick. I'm kind of forgetting now. Ah, uh, okay. So, when you low bar squat, yes, you want to break the hips and the knees. But when it comes to high bar squatting, the front squatting, there's different levels of where you should break first. Now, typically, you want a simultaneous breaking of the hips and the knees. That means that the angle of your torso to your hips and the angle of your knee will generally, if you're high bar squat, good ankle mobility, will generally break at the same time, right? It's not one and then the other. Um, and it's typically not knees first and then hips. Because that would look like this. But some people, even like myself, uh, and a lot of um, Olympic lifters and so on, they might find it much better for them to break just like millisecond uh, breaking up the knees before the hips or initiating, so to speak, the lift by breaking up the knees when in fact they're really simultaneously doing it, but their initiations kind of started by breaking up the knees first. So it's totally going to depend on you guys. So keep that in mind. High bar squatter, 
probably a simultaneous breaking of hips and knees. Low bar squatter, most likely uh, breaking at the hips before you break at the knees. Now guys, here's an addendum to that last point. A lot of times people end up completely losing their core tightness when they overemphasize the breaking at the hips part, right? So whether you're a low bar or high bar squatter, just because you're breaking the hips first doesn't mean you disengage the core. What happens then is you end up getting a pelvic tilt, right? Quite often, that's not what you want. What you really want is an engagement of the hips while you break the angle. And it's not necessarily something that, it's not necessarily like this, but it's more so just that allowing the hips to come back while they're still being engaged. Okay guys, so we're not like this and then this, like it's just a complete disengagement of my glutes. It's not that at all. You want to keep everything tight, whether you're high bar squatting, low bar squatting, whether you break the hips first or simultaneous break of knees and hips. One of the common bodybuilder mistakes when it comes to squatting is assuming that you're going to maximize your leg growth by keeping constant tension, quote unquote, on your quads. And uh, sometimes what people will do is they won't come out to a full knee extension. I mean, we're not asking you guys to break your, to like completely lock out your knee 110% hyperextend it. But you generally want, you know, your knees, your legs to be nice and straight. Uh, a lot of people do is, you know, they think they're keeping constant tension and they're just doing continuous reps. And that's cool and all, but in my honest opinion, in my, uh, however experienced you might consider my experienced opinion, you don't want to treat your stable squat, your primary squat, as a continuous squatting exercise. You want to treat it like a strength movement and treat each individual rep ah, almost like its own set. Uh, you're not necessarily getting less tension by you know, um, you know, stopping at the top. That's one of the misconceptions is that you know, we think we're maximizing tension, maximizing hypertrophy by constant tension. Well, what if you can only do like 135 pounds keeping constant tension versus you know, going down, stopping, getting a good breath, you know, versus doing you know, sets of 225, 315 plus. So there's multiple factors that come into play when it comes to tension. It's not just about um, you know, a constant tension. You want more total tension and quite often that's achieved by not doing continuous reps. You know? uh, it's easier to achieve progressive overload through individual squatting reps versus continuous reps. It's gonna be harder for you to increase the weight on a regular basis, which is the, the, the primary uh, mechanism of growing, right? Progressive tension overload. All right guys, now the biggest squat mistake of them all, and this applies to all lifts, and I'll probably make another video about this, is uh, ego lifting. And uh, this topic itself it goes out in multiple directions because it's kind of interesting. Uh, re regardless of um, how you do things, quite often, uh, whether you're lifting with perfect form or not perfect form, there's, there's, there's typically ego involved with lifting regardless, you know, you're trying to get to a really, really strong squat. Typically there's ego involved with that, you know, the attainment of that really high squat, even if it's with great form, there's typically some there's sort of ego uh, involved. For example, you might have, uh, you might be trying to satisfy your ego having the best form possible. So it's not what we, when people say like leave your ego at the door, um, what actually is, is meant is uh, different from completely remove the ego from everything that you do involving lifting weights. Because quite typically, quite honestly, a lot of people uh, have a long-term kind of ego gratification. And that's more acceptable to lifting itself because it helps you accomplish the goal at hand. What I mean by ego lifting, uh, what people mean by ego lifting is momentary ego gratification. What that means is, uh, trying to do something right then, right there, so that you feel bigger, sharp, better, right? Than maybe, maybe than the next person, or for your own kind of self-inflation of your ego. Uh, and this comes in many forms, shapes, and sizes, right guys? It can come in the, the form, typically, uh, what we, the kind of uh, instant ego gratification we try to keep people from doing is um, usually loading up more weight than they can handle, more weight than is necessary, uh, to accomplish uh, the goal at hand and uh, using the kind of form that is probably going to get them hurt or isn't going to uh, re isn't really aligned with the proper goals that they have. So what often this looks like is 
somebody might have, um, let's just say like hypertrophy goals, right? And they go into the gym, they're squatting, and next thing you know, you know, they're, they're maxing out, right? That's one version of ego lifting. If your goal was to, you know, cause hypertrophy, why are you doing one rep maxes in the gym? Um, another form of, you know, instant ego gratification when it comes to the squat might be uh, going from, you know, good, nice, you know, to the best of your ability, good kind of deep squats, you know, as low as you can get, uh, probably to parallel, let's just say, but then increasing the weight uh, while decreasing, um, you know, the, the form, the range of motion, just because you want to, you know, lift as heavy weight as possible. And usually this goes from workout to workout. And over time, what happens is a lot of people's form just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And there isn't uh, some sort of, there, there isn't like a, a standard that, that connects one workout from the next. So one person's, uh, you know, might be like, ah, if I squat 400 pounds, but, um, and then you might squat 500 pounds in the future, but that 500 pounds ends up looking way worse than the 400 pounds, which looks way worse than the 300 pounds, and it just gets worse over time. And uh, typically that kind of lifting ends up leading to injuries and stuff like that. And uh, as you guys can tell, I can kind of, I'm going off on a tangent, but the kind of lifting we want to stay away from is this momentary ego gratification have a goal, achieve that goal, uh, avoid all of these, um, all of these squat mistakes, and uh, go to the gym and do, uh, and accomplish the purpose that you went there for, right guys? Uh, for example, um, if you're trying to, you know, build your strength for powerlifting, then use the proper form that's aligned with the goal, use the kind of rep ranges that's aligned with the goal. If you are focused on bodybuilding and you squat, uh, you know, still don't make these mistakes. And at the same time, you don't necessarily need to, you, you don't have to be so focused on your lower rep strength like a power lifter might. You know, don't let that ego come in and think that you need to lift uh, crazy heavy while lifting, while breaking, like letting your form break down, um, just because, you know, you kind of want to get that instant gratification of be like, oh yeah, I hit some heavy ass squats. It's like, dude, you're, aren't, you, aren't you squatting for leg growth? Like why, why did you need to max out? So. Guys, keep all of these mistakes, all of these things in, in mind, and try your best to avoid making these mistakes. All right, guys? Um, yeah. Hope you enjoyed this video. This is Matt Ogus. I'm signing off. Uh, yep. Uh, if this video helped you, make sure that you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. And one last thing, guys, if you like my videos, make sure you hit that little bell so that it makes sure that you're subscribed to uh, all of my, uh, so that you get all my videos, otherwise, like, you might not get them. So, just want to let you know about that. Uh, last but not least, uh, if you guys are um, looking to uh, shred some fat, links in the bio. Uh, if you guys want to learn about nutrition and training, links in the bio, all my programs and stuff, link is in the bio. So, woo! That's it, guys. See you in the next video.